In part one, we looked at electric vehicles and hybrids from the 1960s and 70s. If you want to check out that video, click the link above. We now move on to the 1980s, where individuals all around the world didn't want to give up on finding an alternative to the internal combustion engine. These were the days before our knowledge of global warming, and the motivation was around reducing city pollution and freedom from the reliance on foreign oil. OK, let's get started. Before we get started on 80s electric vehicles, here's a couple from the 70s that I missed in part one. Thanks to Thomas Sharinsky, who put me onto the EMA-1. Produced in the communist Czechoslovakia in 1970, it was a tiny car but could take two adults and two children. The car was driven through two motors on each rear wheel, removing the need for a differential, and like modern EVs, the direct motors allowed for regenerative braking. The top speed was 31 miles an hour or 50 kilometers an hour with a range of 31 miles or 50 kilometers. In 1977, Volvo were also experimenting with electric vehicles. Known for their boxy cars, they made the ultimate boxy prototype, simply known as the Volvo electric car. Volvo only built two concepts shown here. The car had a top speed of 43 miles an hour or 70 kilometers an hour. The Soviet Union was experimenting with electric cars of its own, with the VAZ-2801 in 1980. It was based on the VAZ-2101, which itself was based on the Fiat 124. It used lighter nickel-zinc batteries and an aluminium frame, but even then could only manage 54 miles an hour or 87 kilometers an hour with a range of 68 miles or 110 kilometers. There was a hope that it could be used during the Moscow Olympics in 1980. Only 50 were produced as a test, but they were found to be impractical. There was no recharging network, and 68 miles doesn't get you very far in the vast Soviet territory. Those nickel-zinc batteries could also only last 150 charges before they needed to be replaced. Ever since the rebirth of electric cars in 1959, people kept trying new designs in the hope that one day we could make a successful alternative to the internal combustion engine. In 1981, Jet Industries took the North American Ford Escort and its sister Mercury Lynx and offered electric conversions, dubbed the Electrica. Jet Industries weren't strangers to converting vehicles to electric power, creating the Electra van in 1978 from the Subaru Sambar, and also converting the Dodge Omni 024 as the Jet Electrica 007. The Ford Escort was a popular car in the 1980s, based on the same underpinnings as the European Ford Escort Mark III. Jet Industries benefited from the Department of Energy handouts in the late 70s designed to find a way of reducing the USA's dependency on foreign oil. The car used 16 6-volt batteries and a 12-volt battery, giving it a top speed of 70 miles an hour or 110 kilometers an hour and a range of 50 miles or 80 kilometers. Despite it being a full-size car, Jet Industries only managed to sell 3,000 converted cars between the late 70s and early 80s. The US Postal Service was seeking a replacement for the stalwart Jeep DJ that it had used since the 1950s. As we saw in the previous video, they had tried an electric Jeep DJ as well as a converted commuter car in the late 70s. Still without a replacement, by 1981 they tried another electric alternative, the all-aluminium Curbwatt by Grumman Aerospace, makers of the Apollo Lunar Lander. It ran on 14 6-volt lead-acid batteries with a 40-mile or 64km range and a top speed of 55 miles an hour or 88km an hour. Grumman built 50 for the Postal Service to try out, and although they were used until 1992, they were ultimately unsuccessful. But it wasn't all bad for Grumman, as they won the contract to replace the Jeep DJ with their petrol-powered Grumman LLV, built on the Chevy S10 chassis that's still a common sight on American roads today. Unique Mobility launched the Electrek in 1982. Its styling may have been heavily influenced by Star Wars, but the car featured both regenerative braking and a sled to quickly remove the 16 6-volt batteries, allowing for them to be fast swapped. 
The car had a top speed of 75 miles an hour or 120 kilometers an hour with a 100 mile or 160 kilometer range. The list price was around $25,000, which today is around $66,000 or 54,000 pounds. Weaning America off foreign oil didn't come cheap and only 50 to 75 fiberglass clad Electrex were ever produced. Ubiquity Mobility is actually still around today as UQM Technologies, selling electric drives for buses, lorries, cars, boats and, and even aeroplanes. General Motors has a long history of investigating electric technology and we'll take a look at the ill-fated EV1 in another video. But after the mid-70s Electrovet concept, GM took another look in 1983, producing a full-size concept of what this electric car might look like. This would kickstart the work that would eventually lead to the EV1. Over in Denmark, the Hope Computer Company was working in secret on its next big project. Soon it became clear it would be an electric car, the first Danish car for many years. The Hope Whisper W1 was proudly launched at an event that lives on to this day in Danish folklore for all the wrong reasons. The driver of the Whisper was an engineer who'd been working around the clock to get the car ready and he was exhausted. While driving it around the track, he fell asleep at the wheel, driving the car into a barrier. Although no one was hurt, it was a very embarrassing event, especially in front of 3,000 guests, the world's press, and the Danish Prime Minister. What was to be a day quite literally of hope turned into a day of ridicule and the butt of jokes for years to come. Hope tried again with the Whisper 2, but they couldn't get it into production. Sir Clive Sinclair led nothing short of a computing revolution in the UK with his ZX80, ZX81 and ZX Spectrum computers. A serial innovator, he used the money created from these computers to make an innovative portable TV and continued work on a series of electric cars starting in the late 70s. Sinclair was convinced there was a market for a light electrical car that could go about 30 miles on a charge. It could be more weatherproof than a moped and lightly cheaper using injection molded plastic and polypropylene for the body. Cycle company Rally wanted to release electric bicycles, so in 1983 the government created a new category of electrically assisted pedal cycle. The vehicle could be driven by people 14 years and older without a driving license but had to go no faster than 15 miles an hour or 24 kilometers an hour. Sinclair saw his electric vehicle could fit perfectly, so converted his existing design to something that would fit into this new law. All work on the car was done in complete secrecy and tellingly without any market research. What Sinclair focused on was wind tunnel testing, believing that the way to longer range was through lower aerodynamic drag. The C5 was launched in January 1985, not the best time for an electric skate that had no weather protection. It had a range of just 20 miles or 32 kilometers, although the insipid battery meant pedaling assistance would often be required. Clive Sinclair was keen to say that this was just the first of many electric cars. The larger C10 and C15 would follow. Although the company pointed out that the C5 driver sat at the same height as a driver of a regular car, it was still very low to the ground, and many felt it was a death trap on the road. With no market research, the team had failed to realise some of its glaring problems. It was marketed as a way to commute to the train station, but it would easily get wet left standing outside all day, and was light enough for someone to pick it up and steal it. With a big backlash in the press, sales were disappointed, with many having to be sold at a steep loss. But this hasn't stopped Sir Clive from trying to perfect the commuter bike concept. He released the foldable electric Zyke in 1992 and the A-Bike in 2006, with an electric version launched on Kickstarter in 2015, and they're still available today for just £400 or $500. There was also the spiritual successor to the C5, the X1 that was launched in 2010, but failed to get into production. Although the C5 was the butt of many jokes, it's becoming something of a collectible and today has a vibrant fan base. Over in the USA and GM was looking at electric vehicles once more. 
They heard there would be a solar powered race in 1987 from Darwin at the top of Australia to Adelaide in the south, a distance of 3000 kilometers or almost 1900 miles. The vehicles would have to make the entire distance powered only by the sun. GM worked with Aerovironment and Hughes Aircraft to produce a lightweight vehicle called the Sun Racer. It had very low drag and was covered in solar panels that could generate up to 1500 watts of power. New innovations in rare earth magnet motors meant the vehicle would have improved performance. The new motor was lighter and GM claimed it was 92% efficient. Extra power from the solar panels would be stored in lightweight silver oxide batteries. The Sun Racer didn't just win, it crushed the competition. It finished in Adelaide in just over 5 days at an average speed of 42 miles an hour or 67 kilometers an hour. The second place car took another 2 days to arrive. The Sun Racer set a solar powered vehicle record the following year, a record bested in 2014 by Ashika University's Sky Ace Tiger at 56 miles an hour or 91 kilometers an hour. Denmark was down after the Hope Whisper debacle, but it wasn't out. Seemingly taking notes from Sinclair C5, L-Trans produced a larger but very similar three-wheeled electric car known as the Mini L. It had room for one with the space at the back just big enough for a small child or some luggage. Initially the car used lead acid batteries with a top speed of 25 miles an hour or 40 kilometers an hour and a 43 mile or 70 kilometer range. Almost immediately the company ran into financial difficulty, but new incarnations of the company kept producing the Mini L, eventually selling it around Europe and even in North America. What's surprising is this car is still being produced today by Citycom in Germany, where it's been renamed as the City L. The drivetrain has been improved and uses lighter and more powerful lithium ion batteries, taking the top speed to 40 miles an hour or 63 kilometers an hour, with an improved range of 75 miles or 120 kilometers. You can own your own brand new City L for just £9,000 or $11,000. Finally, Audi worked on a hybrid concept in 1989 with the Audi 100 Duo. The front wheels were driven by the 100's usual 2.3 litre 5 cylinder engine, but the rear wheels were driven by a motor powered by a large batch of NiCad batteries in the boot that took 8 hours to recharge. In 1991 Audi produced a similar concept based on the 100 Avant that had permanent 4 wheel drive. Audi said the car could get 50 miles just on electric power. To get early advert free access to new videos or to appear in the credits, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month and hit that subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.